in the interest of time. We have so much exciting content to get through today. So I'm going to kick us off. Um, <laughs> again, a very warm welcome if you just joined. I've said it about four times, but that's the nature of the game when people join at different times. Um, so welcome to Fearless Futures webinar, Equity in Pride, Planning Inclusive Events. I am Ruby Clark, she, her pronouns, and I'm Director of Consultancy here at Fearless Futures. And I am here with the wonderful Maureen Galvez, also she, her pronouns, who is an expert facilitator, creative learning designer for anti-oppression education. For over a decade, Maureen has facilitated a variety of educational programs, conducted anti-inequity research in the US, Argentina, and France. And Marie majored in political science and gender studies at Bernard College of Columbia University, and recently graduated from the Institute of Humane Education with an MED focused on social justice education and experience-based learning. As Director of Consultancy at Fearless Futures, if you don't know me, I take care of all things consultancy and advisory at Fearless Futures, which means I am responsible for looking at reviewing um, various different policies, processes, and uh, structural parts of organizations, um, structural content, and offering insights on how we can pull the levers for transformative change. So that is us. Um, before we get into the content that you're all here um, to hear myself and Maureen talk about, a little bit of housekeeping. So first reminder, closed captioning is available in this webinar. So if um, you don't know where to find that on Zoom, down at the bottom of um, your screen, there's a, a menu bar and there'll be a little CC box and you can just click that to turn on the closed captions functioning um, and click show subtitle so that that's available to you. Also to let you know that this webinar will be recorded, but you will all be anonymous. So only myself, Maureen, and our producer, Shauna, who's here as Fearless Futures, uh, will be visible. So you'll all remain anonymous. However, we would love to get you involved. Um, so we invite you to send us questions throughout this webinar. There is a Q and A um, button also down the bottom in the menu bar. So don't feel like you have to hold your question till the very end. Send them through as they come to you on anything that we are talking about. And Maureen and I will do our best to get through as many as possible when we get to the end. So that's the housekeeping, which means um, we can launch straight in. So welcome, Maureen. Thank you so much for being here. How, how are you doing this morning? Thanks, Ruby. Thank you for taking us through that introduction. I'm doing well this morning. I'm calling in. I'm here from France um, in Paris, and it's a crisp, sunny morning um, and a bank holiday. So, yeah. How are you? Being here on a bank holiday. I'm really well. It's blue skies in London, in southeast London. And I'm hoping, I think that we might have transitioned into spring. I try and kind of maintain expectations with British weather, but it feels like it's warmer and things are blossoming in nature. So I'm in good spirits. Um, so we have lots to get through. Let's let's jump straight in. I wanted to start by talking about the kind of way that we approach planning events for Pride and kind of at the very um, at the very top to talk about that broad framing and, and what we need to be thinking about. Often, when it comes to planning events for Pride, there is a default to go to the theme of celebration, right? That's kind of like where a lot of planning goes into is how do we celebrate Pride? How do we celebrate LGBTQIA plus um, colleagues and identities? And I, I want to be clear, I'm not saying don't do that, but it's important for us to remember straight off the bat that Pride is about both celebration, right, by LGBTQIA plus people and allies of their identities, communities, humanity, brilliance, joy, achievement, resilience, all of those things are really important for us to center. But Pride and the history of Pride has also always been about protest and resistance against the violence, the oppression, the inequity, and the invisibilization of LGBTQIA plus people in the world. 
that they have faced and continue to face, right? It's not a historical issue, but that has always been the origins of pride. It's always been the spirit of pride. We know that that origin story of what pride is really about is, is rooted in resistance to the brutal injustice and violence that, that I've spoken about. So when we think about the Stonewall riots in 1969, that was led by trans women and femmes of color in New York, um, fighting back against another very violent police raid um, at the Stonewall Inn. If you don't know that history, I really encourage you to, to go and do some digging because it's important for us to remember where pride has come from. And so when it comes to planning our events in and around Pride, we often see, again, this indexing for celebration and, and that can kind of end up looking like platforming um, LGBTQA plus colleagues success stories, who, those who are out or visible in our organizations and maybe centering discourses of celebration and tolerance. And the issue here is, it can end up creating actually quite a lot of labor disproportionately for LGBTQIA plus colleagues. So if, for example, we're focused on like celebrating success stories, um, we're creating a kind of need for LGBTQIA plus folks to be at the center of this celebration and that might not necessarily feel like what folks want to be doing. It's quite, it can create risk um, to, to create that need. And in particular, if that's happening in an organizational context where there's not really any attention or um, commitment is a better word, actually, that's being given to equity and inclusion for folks in the everyday of their working lives, actively addressing policy, structure and culture, then frankly, that registers for folks as quite a tokenistic gesture. So if we're only focusing on celebrating LGBTQIA plus people this one month of the year, platforming mm -hmm. their stories, but we're not really thinking about their everyday inclusion, that can register quite as very tokenistic. So what I would encourage us to do then in the spirit of what, what I'm sharing around the origins of Pride is to plan events and create space within events to be explicit and honest about the reality of violence and inequity that LGBTQIA plus folks are facing and the ways that your company's addressing this perhaps internally, right? And also to to shine a light on where that inequity comes from. Like, are we talking about the systems that produce that inequity, right? Are we talking about homophobia or heterosexism? Are we talking about transphobia and cissexism? So naming these so that we can agitate is really key and not over-indexing for celebration alone. So I've said a lot, but that's kind of what I want us to, to hold on to. And with this cautioning, Maureen, that I've offered our, our audience um, from the outset against tokenism and celebration only events, I'd love if you could talk to us a bit more about kind of the specific themes and language to either prioritize or disinvest from when we're in the nuts and bolts of planning. Yeah, great. Thanks, Ruby. Yeah, so as you just um segue to me, I'm going to be talking about some language and some words that we tend to hear a lot around pride. Um, and the first I'm going to focus on is the plea for tolerance that we often hear about. So I'm going to be talking about tolerance and acceptance um, as, as framing words. So when we think about tolerance, to tolerate someone's identity is not the same as to affirm them or to uplift them, to learn from them, but it's to conditionally allow them to enter our spaces. So when tolerance is the reason people considered different are allowed to enter, it's up to those people who are considered different to keep themselves tolerable to the people who let them in, right? And 
that's the problem that we see. Tolerance discourse makes the role of systems of oppression in determining the people who get to be tolerant and those who must be tolerated. So it's oppression that establishes certain groups as dominant and as normal, whose tolerability is never up for debate. And those people who are abnormal and other, whose tolerability always is. So in this way, it puts the onus of change on the individual behavior, behaviors of people and organizations and not on the institutions themselves. So <clears throat> instead of tolerance being the bar, we want to try and build our institutions so that that is never a question if people's genders or sexualities are tolerated. And lastly, what I'll say about tolerance is that it's often presented as an alternative to violence, mm. but it can play a part in justifying violence. And we've seen tolerance discourse be used in this way for decades by Western imperialism. I mean, I wanted to name that um, as a justification for war and for extraction. Tolerance has been a powerful way of distinguishing the West from a barbaric East, um, from a barbaric Islam. Um, it's been used to distinguish the civilized from the uncivilized. So we should be very careful when bringing in that framework of tolerance in our fights um, for LGBTQIA plus equity and into our pride events. Mm -hmm. Um, the second word I'm going to be talking about is acceptance. It's another slippery phrase that appears around pride a lot. Um, and acceptance discourse also has a certain amount of conditionality attached to it that um, it seems to be kind of conditioned on an implicit if, right? Like we sometimes have to accept things we ultimately disagree with or dislike. Um, but so that's why it feels kind of um, slippery and icky to use around um, around pride, because as long as we disagree with someone's humanity, we cannot build equity for them, right? The two will always be in conflict. So instead of tolerance and acceptance, we would really encourage you to reorient to the words inclusion and belonging. So first with inclusion, you can't include people and systems that are designed to exclude them, right? So at the core, inclusion is actually quite a radical and ambitious proposition, right? If, if, taken, um, if taken seriously. Inclusion from the get-go presupposes that institutions need to transform the way that they operate um, and define in and out groups. And secondly, with belonging, it's it's also actually a very ambitious goal because belonging can't be faked. You can't ask a excluded or marginalized person to feel like they belong. They get to decide when they feel like they belong. So when asking, when someone is asking themselves, do I belong? They're really asking themselves, am I seen here? Am I heard? Am I believed? Am I valued? So we need to explicitly create conditions in which their identity and their humanity is part of the fabric. So in this way, feeling like you belong is an outcome to that. So in terms of pride events, think about this paradigm shift from tolerance to inclusion, uh, from acceptance to belonging, and think about reflecting that in the wording of your event invitation, um, the copy on your website, in your speaker scripts, etc. Love that so much, Maureen. And I think it's really powerful for us to connect this language of tolerance and acceptance to much broader historical and contemporary practices of imperialism, right? And the way that LGBTQIA plus folks have been invoked to justify broader projects of oppression because sometimes it can feel very detached like the language of tolerance has become a very dominant framework so I love that you've taken us through how there's really a conditionality of like who's allowed to be tolerated and whose tolerability is never questioned and I think that framing is incredibly powerful for 
then planning our events and, and thinking about how are we creating conditions for inclusion in the events that we hold and, and beyond around Pride? I love that. And I think everything you've shared also really connects to, to intersectional and wide inclusion, right? When we talk about inclusion in how, in how folks are setting up events around Pride. So broadening who is included and who you create those conditions for belonging for, right? Exactly as, as you spoke to. Um, anyone who knows Fearless Futures as an organization, the, the way that we work uh, and the paradigms that we use, will know that we at Fearless Futures will forever encourage you to plan intersectionally when you're planning any events. Um, but this is extremely key when it comes to pride, right? Because the LGBTQIA plus community is vastly diverse. I mean, it's a huge umbrella in and of itself um, that sort of encap encapsulates a very broad range um, of experiences and lived realities already. And we need to be thinking about how gender, sexual, romantic identities intersect with race, with class, with faith, with disability. So maybe we can start by actually defining what we mean when we talk about intersectionality. Let's start there, Maureen, um, if you can share with our audience. Intersectionality, what are we talking about? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Ruby. So I imagine many of you who are here are already familiar with intersectionality and at least have heard the word, um, but I'll do a brief overview of its origins because I think it's so important to understand the full context um, in order to understand the, the meaning of the word and what we mean when we talk about intersectionality. So intersectionality is an analytical framework coined by um, Kimberly Crenshaw, who is an American legal scholar. And she first wrote about intersectionality actually a long time ago, nearly 40 years ago, when she came across a case of um, where a black woman named Emma de Graffenried was suing General Motors. And Emma was actually representing an entire group of black women who claimed that General Motors only hired black women as domestic workers or janitors, but never for manufacturing jobs. So Emma sued the employer for race and gender discrimination. Well, the problem was that the court would not allow her to file for both simultaneously. She had to choose just one. And the judge dismissed her suit because he couldn't prove that the employer discriminated for race or gender. And this is because there were black men who were manufacturers and engineers at General Motors and there were white women. So the court, with the laws that were in place at the time, could not recognize the specific discrimination of Black women, leaving people like Emma to completely fall through the cracks. So for those living with multiple oppressions, these come together to create different, compounded, pluralistic lived experiences. And that is why we need to think about our fight for inclusion intersectionally, because otherwise people living with multiple, multi, multiple marginalized identities fall through the cracks. And intersectionality broadly is a framework to rethink conventional interventions. So it's an effort to think about what happens when the kind of inequity that people are prepared to deal with overlaps with a kind of inequity that they haven't given any thought to or have no official tools for. Mm. So Ruby, I'll pass it over to you um, to explain really how that intersects, <laughs> no pun intended, um, with our topic today of planning intersectional pride events. Wonderful. Thank you, Maureen. So, I mean, just building off everything you shared really intersectionality as an analytical lens allows us to look at how the experiences of homophobia or heterosexism is the language that we use at Fearless Futures for queer women will have a racialized component for queer women who are black, who are brown, who are racialized as non-white, right? That race has a role to play, or racism, I should say, has a role to play in how they will experience inequity as a, as a queer person. 
And, you know, again, going back to this acknowledgement that pride was started through the resistance of queer black folks, particularly predominantly trans black femmes. And yet for a long time, the face of pride has often been white gay cis men. And I want to be really clear, I'm not saying that these folks are not central to the history of Pride and shouldn't also be centered. But when we fail to plan intersectionally around Pride, around our events, we do tend to prioritize our default in a community. And so that means folks who experience inequity because of one aspect of their identity, their sexuality in this, in this uh, context, but aren't experiencing other inequities on top compounding. So what is this, what does it look like to bring this lens meaningfully into planning events for Pride? Well, first of all, thinking about if you're having a panel of speakers, who are your panelists, right? And I want to be clear that what we don't want to end up doing is a tokenistic gesture of kind of thinking about the optics and then adding in a token Black lesbian right? Like that tokenistic gesture isn't necessarily what intersectionality looks like. It's more about going beyond representation and optics to meaningfully create space and explicitly center the lived experience um, of folks who sit at the intersections. So not just dropping them in as an addition, but really meaningfully embedding um, their experience into the events that you're planning. It also means going into your planning of whatever event you're going to go ahead uh, and do or events with the expectation that your audience, your panelists, your participants and so on may be LGBTQIA plus folks who are disabled, who are Muslim, who are Jewish, who are working class. And then on that basis, from that recognition, prioritizing um, venue or virtual platform accessibility, or if you're in person, having halal and kosher food options, right? Broadening who we are thinking about when it comes to um, whatever it is that, that we're deciding to do. And just keeping at the forefront this question of which experiences within the LGBTQA plus community might we not be thinking about in the, on the offset um, and including. So, Maureen, I want to spend some time highlighting really some of, because one of the things that often happens is because the umbrella of LGBTQIA plus folks is so broad, sometimes there's this sense of like, well, how do we include everyone? Who do we prioritize? Like, is there some sort of disparity or divergence between equity and needs for these groups. And so I want to spend some time focusing on where those shared roots of inequity and therefore the shared roots of equity actually exist for folks within, within this broad umbrella, um, who are in, in part, you know, currently being presented as in some way opposed, right? Mm -hmm. That there's something diametrically opposed. And I know organizations uh, are grappling with this. So I'd love if you can take us through through some of this. Mm, yeah, absolutely. So as you just mentioned, Ruby, um, there's currently a massive crackdown on the rights of transgender people. Um, in the US, there are currently 70 bills that have been passed and 372 that are active. So there seem to be new ones coming up every day. Um, seeking to block trans people from having basic health care, education, and legal recognition. And also in the UK, hate crimes against trans people are increasing yearly, and there is just so much relentless, hostile rhetoric about trans people dominating the media headlines. And one of the cornerstones of this anti-trans rhetoric is that trans rights are a threat to the rights of women and girls, and increasingly that it is a threat to the rights of lesbians. Um, some recent headlines in the UK include, quote, uh, lesbians facing extinction, 
and uh, the cancellation of women is bigger than a culture war, or also why put a tiny trans lobby over the rights of women? Um, this wording is interesting, over the rights of women. So when companies are planning Pride events, these are narratives that they're grappling with, as you said, Ruby, um, and that they have an opportunity to speak on. Mm -hmm. Trans rights are such a hot, but a, a hot button issue right now um, that it's more important than ever to have a clear understanding of the overlapping and connected struggles of the LGBTQIA plus movement when planning Pride events. So first, are trans rights actually a threat to lesbian rights, as the current discourse would have us believe? Well, um, it's important to know that lesbians, by and large, certainly don't think so. Research has repeatedly shown that um, that lesbians are the most likely of the whole LGBTQ plus community to be supportive of trans people. And that is just so, so important to name. A recent study conducted on 3,600 LGBTQ plus adults have revealed that cis lesbians are not only the most likely to know a trans person at 92%, but the most likely to say they are supportive or very supportive of trans people at 96%. That's compared to 89% of uh, LGBTQ people overall and about 69% of non-LGBTQ plus people. 69% still being a higher number than often the media would have us believe, right, with this like relentless attack on um, trans rights. So it's important to know that when people advocate for trans rights on behalf of lesbians, like so many prominent people are currently doing, the vast majority of cis lesbians, uh, vast majority being 96% would disagree. And um, so making this belief actually lesbophobic, right? Very, very incorrect. Secondly, the belief that trans rights run in opposition to the rights of women or other queer folks is such a tragic misunderstanding of the origins of their oppression. It can be tempting to focus on the present day manifestations of sexism, of homophobia, of transphobia, since that is what we're bombarded with and the narratives have us think that all of these issues are very, very distinct. However, when you look at their, their history of oppression, the history um, of oppression facing these groups, you quickly realize that they come from the same place. They come from the gender binary, this concept that gender is only categorized um, in two distinct forms. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And Maureen, I, I just, I feel this is so incredibly critical to emphasize. And I'm really grateful that you've, taken us deeply into this terrain because I mean we all know that this discourse is very prominent in the media it also as discourses in the media do is seeping into the fabric of organizations into discussions around how to do pride mm -hmm. equitably meaningfully and this is I know from speaking to lots of of con of contacts clients and colleagues that this is presented as a supposedly an issue to contend with mm. um, and so diving diving deep here is is really important for planning for planning mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and I think it's so key to know our history here so that we can plan inclusive events um confidently and ambitiously yeah. so that idea that there are only two genders is actually a relatively new one. Um, and it was not the global norm until relatively recently, until Europeans colonized the world and imposed their gender system. So the European gender system was an important way, perhaps even the main way that Europeans sought to civilize and extinguish other cultures. Europeans enforced the gender binary in several different ways. I'm gonna talk about three, three main ways. Mm -hmm. By claiming that there were only men and women, that men were superior to women, 
and that men could only be with women and women with men, so romantically and sexually. So here we see just such a such an explicit example that transphobia, sexism, and homophobia were always tied together to consolidate this gender binary from the very beginning. And I'm just going to give you a couple of historical examples to really solidify um, to solidify my point here. So from the start of colonization, myths about the inferiority of colonized people were often attributed to their inability to do gender like white people in Europe. The, the lack of proper manhood and womanhood was evidence to Europeans of savagery, of backwardness, and of a lack of humanity. All across the world, European colonizers violently suppressed any ways of being that they didn't like. And often the very first people that were affected by this violence were people who didn't match European understandings of binary gender expression. A couple examples of that are, for example, Indian, Indian residential schools that were created out of this idea that one needs to um, turn people into proper men and women. So many indigenous societies were forced to become binary men and women through extraordinarily violent and genocidal means. Um, the Hijra is also a gender group in South Asia that were forced onto a registry and then legally outlawed in colonial India by the British Criminal Tribes Act in 1871. So that's kind of transphobia um, during, during colonial times. I'm also going to give you an example of homophobia just to really solidify how incredibly connected and, and linked um, those are. In, 19, in 1533 in Britain, Parliament passed this act called the Buggery Act, which punished male homosexuality and made gay sex punishable by death. And when the British Empire got going, the British were very keen to export their laws everywhere for 300 years, basically. So from the 16th to the 19th century, that's exactly what they did. And they literally exported their laws, criminalizing homosexuality to the places that they colonized, which often had no history or, or of hatred against those groups. Um, and this is called Section 377 of the British Penal Code, if you'd like to look it up after the webinar. But still today, even though Britain has quote unquote left and got rid of its own laws criminalizing homosexuality in the UK, the laws remain in the penal codes of many former colonies, at least 30 of them. And this is the reason why LGBTQ people in countries like Pakistan, Kenya, and Singapore still don't have equality today. So the history of enforcing the gender binary is a violent and bloody one that is a cornerstone of white supremacist, patriarchal, colonial agendas. And enforcing the gender, the gender binary has always been and will always be about propping up white heterosexual cis men. So to wrap this up, I, I hope I've made very clear that identifying trans people as the enemy is misidentifying, it's misdiagnosing the problem. And we need to disinvest from that idea entirely. And pride and, and pride events is an extremely important and exciting moment to ensure that we are. I mean, it really is a kind of crucial moment and an opportunity. Mm -hmm. for us to do that and I think you're absolutely right that we do need to understand this history and you've taken us through I mean so much rich detail there Maureen to highlight that actually the marginalization and oppression of trans folks of queer folks of LGBTQIA plus folks and of cis women is inherently interlinked because of the colonial origins and that then pitting these groups against each other, as we've seen, is also then about power, right? It's a misdiagnosis and it actually furthers the very systems we might think that we're trying to disrupt. So 
we've gone really historical, but I think that's that's critical for us to understand why we're uplifting the fact that equity for folks in in this community is interlinked. So, what does this mean practically? Um, you might be thinking, Ruby Marine, I hear you. Like this all makes sense and is also really powerful and, and important. When I go to my team meeting on Friday tomorrow, like what do I need to be thinking about practically off the back of this? So first of all, this recognition encourages us and pushes us to be intersectional, right? It's very connected to exactly what, what we were speaking about earlier, to recognize this history and also encourages us to be really critical about this narrative that can seep through in Pride events, that the West, Europe, the global North is the kind of beacon of queer liberation, right? That equity and inclusion for LGBTQIA plus folks happens in the global North and kind of the, the global North is spearheading that. So that is the first thing I would say is to hold on to what that means about the, what that, how that informs the themes that we index for in the framing for our events. Also, quite simply, it means not shying away from platforming trans folks in Pride. Include and centre trans people within events that you plan, ensuring that that means you are inviting them to participate fully and show up fully and not with sort of caveats around what they can and cannot talk about, what aspects of their identity can be included and what aspects can't. Again, as Maureen shared with us earlier, this really powerful piece around the difference between tolerating trans folks and accepting them versus actively building conditions for their inclusion and belonging in our events and beyond. What else can we do? Disrupt the gender binary throughout your event. So things like introducing all of your speakers with their pronouns, gender neutral bathrooms on site needs to be a priority if of course you are, you're having an onsite. Um, and again, if you're having an onsite, ensuring that the event is in a safe location for LGBTQIA plus people. And beyond that, I think something that's really powerful is thinking about how power is actually distributed in your planning and work allocation. So are we perpetuating binary gender role ideas in who gets to do what, right? Are we giving all of the kind of more soft skill, emotional, personal parts of the planning to folks who are gendered as women or as femmes? And giving all of the strategic planning um, and more technical skill to those who are gendered as men. So thinking about even how that gender binary might be playing through in the planning itself is a really powerful way that we can do that. Um, the other thing that I think I'd love to share uh, with the audience is knowing that there is a lot of confusion and misinformation about this relationship between equity for queer cis folks and trans and non-binary gender non-conforming people, it might be worth thinking about how you can prepare your attendees coming into an event that is gonna recognize the intersection between equity for those groups. So if you have a gender diverse panel, um, which we would hope that, that you will and encourage you to, and you might be anticipating either questions or actually pushback. First of all, thinking about how you make the, sa the space safe. And as part of that, maybe, you know, it's about thinking, how do we create copy that explicitly highlights the position your organization is taking that recognizes this shared roots of inequity and therefore equity and inclusion for these communities and creating that copy ahead of time for attendees so that you're being really explicit and upfront about the position that you're taking. That creates conditions of safety for folks who are marginalized. It also means you're doing your due diligence to know uh, 
so that folks coming into the space know what your position is as an organization. So you might put together copy for the event. Maybe you put together a cheat sheet um, or you organize a pre-pride event internally uh, with a knowledgeable person um, in consultation. So I've given folks a lot there, but I, I hope that that's kind of distilled the practical um, needs and opportunities based on, on everything that we've taken you through so far. Yeah, thank you, Ruby. Really, really fantastic practical solutions. Um, and I really like what you said there at the end about challenging folks to be explicit about the position that they're taking in their organization. And that's both scary and wildly important and exciting, I think. Um, and I think that's why, you know, learning about the history, learning about the Ostrid roots is really key to being able to take practical action that reflect reflect our values and make LGBTQIA plus folks feel feel safe um, in in these these pride events. So finally, in the little bit of time that we have left, Ruby, I'd love to hear you share with our audience about um, a topic we're calling, we, we call pink washing. Um, not that we coined the term, it was coined much before us, but what is it? What is pink washing? Where do we see it? Um, how does it come about and how, how can folks avoid kind of replicating what we've seen in this, in this space before? I'd love to hear you share about that. Yes, absolutely. So I wanna start by saying that meaningful, transformative equity and inclusion work for any community requires that we take risks. As individuals who are not marginalized by a particular system, we have to take risks. As organizations committed to inclusion, equity and belonging, we also have to take risks. There will be parameters that we're working within, some harder to shift than others, but the work of equity and inclusion is disruptive work. We're disrupting the status quo. And therefore that is risky work. So it's always about thinking about what are the levers of change? How do we shift the dial knowing that there will always be risk attached? So that's a, an important connective uh, tissue between being explicit around um, the shared roots of inequity that you're recognizing and also around the, what I'd like to share about pinkwashing. So pinkwashing in a nutshell, if you've never heard this phrase before, is when organizations, institutions, or governments indeed, sort of profess to support LGBTQIA plus folks, particularly around pride, but not exclusively. And they do that in order to appear progressive and sort of modern, um, tolerant and and therefore benefit from that positioning in global markets, um, on a global stage, across geopolitical terrains, right? We talked at the beginning, right at the top, and we've, we've woven it through about some of the risks and the tripping hazards of this celebration narrative when we go too far in that direction and it becomes tokenistic. And we spoke about who it, who it serves. Largely, it can ultimately serve heterosexual folks who feel like I'm being tolerant and so I'm sort of ticking a box. But I wanna kind of zoom out a bit because the over-indexing of celebration in a particularly in a tokenistic way, um, it serves other purposes too that are connected to pink washing. We know that for over 50 years, Pride Month has become a very powerful economic engine. And we see brands investing very heavily in sponsorship, ads, merchandise that fly the flag of Pride and maybe use LGBTQIA plus symbols and terminology. And it can be the case that these actions are authentically or or in part or in full sort of authentically seek to express material and authentic support for LGBTQIA plus folks. But it can often be a marketing technique 
to win over new customers, right? To increase profits. And that is a reality because we know that um, appearing to be sort of progressive and uh, liberal and tolerant does enable brands, uh, brands to reap profits, that positioning. And so the branding that can happen, the use of LGBTQIA plus symbols and terminology um, in our products and services around Pride can be a marketing strategy. And that's particularly problematic when it occurs in the absence of meaningful investment in equity, inclusion, and belonging for LGBTQIA plus people. And so that's really what pinkwashing is. It's where there's this big celebration and the rainbow flag is everywhere. And you've got loads of products that are branded in pride branding. And the organization is reaping the rewards of that, but maybe under the surface, there's actually no commitment to equity and belonging for these communities in the everyday. So that over-indexing for celebration can also be kind of beneficial in the branding strategy. So why is that so problematic? Well, when we plaster the symbols of pride, remembering that pride has always been about celebration and resistance and protest. When we, when we uh, plaster those symbols of pride across our company branding and products in the absence of meaningfully investing in creating cultures and structures of policies and processes that support inclusion meaningfully, this is really extractive. And it communicates to LGBTQIA plus folks that profiting from their identity is actually more important than enabling, facilitating and building for their success and for their safety in our workplaces. And so we really, really wanna be mindful and committed to disinvesting from that, right? What is key here again is, is not to not celebrate pride. I wanna be really clear that Maureen and I aren't telling you to like not celebrate pride and not create events that, that do um, celebrate LGBTQA plus folks and use the, the, the flag of, of pride and so forth. But it's more the point that I, I wanna make for folks is, it's about making sure that we are also celebrating and supporting resistance and initiatives for equity and inclusion and being proactive about that building um, of policy, of process in our teams, in our organizations, actually all year round. So what does that look like? How do we prioritize that in our events? Maybe we're using... Um, this Pride Month of 2023 to run a roundtable discussion in our organization around how the best way to proactively build um, inclusive parental leave policy, right? Or a trans inclusion policy at work. And maybe we're having a roundtable discussion, making sure that that is intersectional in the panelists who are prioritized. We've included copy on our website about explicitly the positions that we're taking and so it can be that your events are about celebration and thinking about what nuts and bolts you need to put in place beyond pride to build inclusion for folks um, in the LGBTQIA plus community um, across the year and not just within this month. Um, so that's the first piece that I think is quite rich and very important around pinkwashing and how we avoid it and what we what we can do instead. I'm aware of time so I'm going to take us through one more short point and um, and then folks we will have time for, for your questions so make sure that if you haven't shared them I've seen them coming through uh, but if you haven't shared them yet please do drop them into the Q&A at the bottom. Another way that pinkwashing occurs in the world around pride is when companies capitalize on the sort of progressive politics associated with LGBTQIA plus inclusion, while simultaneously maybe engaged in action that actually harms LGBTQIA plus communities. How, what does that look like? 
For example, if a company is engaged in land grabbing or resource extraction or building a pipeline across indigenous land, but uses a rainbow flag for the month of pride, what we need to be thinking about is what does that communicate to LGBTQIA folks who are indigenous, who are black, who are people of color, when we have that branding and sponsorship at our event? For example, we know that branding and spon uh, sponsorship can be a big part of event planning at Pride. So what I would say is if you are using sponsors for your events, we, we have a duty if we are really authentically committed to inclusion for LGBTQIA plus folks to check who our sponsors are. And if you find that they are engaged in um in acts as an organization that does harm communities who are within the lgbtqia plus community where possible we need to be committed to disinvesting from those sponsorship and that's not easy to do like connected to that piece around risk that i spoke to it's it's big right like that's a real challenge but we have to ask ourselves what happens when we aren't willing uh, to take those risks where possible in the interest of prioritizing the equity and inclusion that we know is critical to what Pride is all about. So, okay, we have given you so much, folks. We've taken you through moving beyond tokenistic celebration, away from tolerance and acceptance into really thinking about inclusion and belonging in a meaningful sense, dug into intersectionality, and how to meaningfully use that lens in your planning, recognizing the shared roots of equity for folks who are currently being pitted against each other within the LGBTQIA plus community, and also that piece around pinkwashing and what it means to really be mindful that we're not just capitalizing on the month of pride and actually on these communities but really making sure that we're serving lgbtqa plus folks in everything that we do so we've given folks loads marine um i've seen some of the questions coming through and i'm really excited to answer them what we're going to do now folks is first and foremost your feedback is extremely important to us we want to know what you enjoyed also what you want to hear more of from us what webinar are you like I really want Fearless Futures to come on, talk about this, hash it out and give us some steer. So uh, my wonderful colleague, Shauna, who is here supporting all things tech, um, is going to share the talk. link. Marie, oh, gonna sorry, share sorry. I didn't realize. I thought you were going to share the link. So I can also. Um, I, I have the link. It. OK, Maureen, you're 10 steps ahead of me. So there is um, the link for you. Uh, please do click and open that, give us your feedback, and we will give you two minutes to click open that form. It's very short, so you can run through it, and also to think if there's any questions um, that have come up that you haven't put uh, into the Q&A yet. And Maureen and I will take some time quietly um, to let you do that and look through uh, some of your wonderful questions. Okay, so many good questions. I'm going to give folks another couple of seconds to finish finish off that form if you're working through it. We will try to get through as many as we can. Uh, 
Okay, Maureen, there's so many. So let's let's jump in. You and I talk a lot about where we go to to enhance our own understanding and keep investing in that lifelong education journey. So I love this first question. Who should we be reading to, listening to, to improve, sorry, who should we be reading and listening to, to improve our understanding of colonialism and gender binaries? I want to get confident talking about and understanding this history. I really love listening to and learning from you. How do I take this? How can I take this learning further? Um, Maureen, you took us through this segment, so I'd love you to share with our audience where where can they go for more? Sure. Um, that's such a wonderful question. And we were talking about all these books with Ruby beforehand, and I was thinking, oh, we probably can't get into everything during the webinar, but I do love this question. Um, I actually just went and snatched off my bookshelf this little book called um, Beyond the Gender Binary. It's by Alok Vaid Manan. Oh, sorry, my. Yeah, there you go. Oh, yeah. Um, but it's just like the smallest little book. So I always tell people that they can start there um, if they want to learn more, because it has a really like digestible, clear explanation of what the gender binary is and also some really useful, you know, facts and, and history about where the gender binary originated. And um, there's also a book called The Coloniality of the Gender Binary, which is a bit more academic, but there's some really great information there. Um, and I want to point everyone to a website also um, called, I have it here, um, I think it's raceforward.org, but if you type in race forward to Google, um, they have some really fantastic resources there and like webinars and talks that they have recorded and have put on their website um, that has some incredible information. So those are the three suggestions I'm dropping here, but Ruby, I would love to hear hear from you too. Love that so much, Maureen. I have to like heavily plus one on Alok's book, Beyond the Gender Binary. Yeah, and, and also, Instagram too. They have a great Instagram account. I was just going to say their Instagram, their um, goodreads.com, they have like collated this absolutely incredible resource list of all of the resources that they um, also used in in writing this book. So basically everything Alok touches, talks about, thinks about is just, yeah, incredibly um, mind opening and instructive. Um, for me, the work of Maria Lujones has been really, really um, instrumental in my understanding of the colonial origins of, of the gender binary. Um, so I will put Maria Jonah's name there in the chat um yeah so much out there but I think that they are wonderful wonderful mm -hmm. starting points um what else do we have okay second question this is a really, really important question so this person has asked how do we engage effectively cis het staff cisgender heterosexual staff in trans inclusion when the government seems to be in the process of rolling back rights for trans folks we probably can't fire people or put them on performance management because they view trans inclusion as a threat to women's rights or claim it conflicts with their interpretation of their faith big question um and a really really important one so the first thing that i would say is what really um, strikes me in this question is that there's clearly a lack of understanding or um, misunderstanding of what trans inclusion means, why it's important. And again, it goes back to this piece um, that Maureen was sharing about actually understanding the roots of inequity for trans folks. So the first thing to say is there might be an education piece, like actually upskilling people with skills and tools to understand where the oppression of transgender folks comes from. Um, so that's the first thing I would say. And that could look like um, bringing in external support uh, from experts who can guide participants through that understanding um, and ensure they have, they have the tools to navigate um, this where it comes up. 
it might be that you start with um, reading and listening and sharing resources um, and then coming together to, to discuss them. The other thing I really want to pull out here is the idea um, that inclusion for anyone can be like in opposition to our faith or our politics or, or anything else is a bit of a misnomer. Like if we're talking about um, cis sexism, we're talking about cis sexism. It doesn't matter where it comes from. Um, cis sexism does what it says on the tin, but we do need to understand the roots of oppression for these folks in order to solve for it. So for me, it sounds like um, there's a learning piece to, to start with before we immediately put people on performance management, because if we haven't created the conditions for people to understand the misinformation and myths that cis sexism furthers, we might want to go back a step to consider what we are doing as an organization to to create those conditions marine anything you want to add on this question i mean ruby you just touched on everything really effectively that i was thinking about um that institutional piece making sure you have like institutional backing maybe to create those spaces for for people to learn um depending on you know the the identity of the the person who asked the question or who seeks to further that change um might be a really important thing to consider um, just because there are issues that sa of safety that definitely arise. Um, but yeah, I agree with absolutely everything <laughs> that you just said. Um, Love that. Yeah. Um, super. Okay, we have time for a few more. So let me go back to our questions. Um, this is, I think, a really interesting uh, question. Thank you. Thank you also to, to folks whose questions we've managed to answer so far. I want to do allyship sessions for non-LGBT people during Pride, but wondering if it's better to wait until post-Pride not to take up airtime. And is this something FF offers? Um, Maureen, do you want to speak to the first part? I can speak to the second part. We can take this one together. Um, how about you get us started and then I'll pitch in if that's all right. Yeah, sure. So I want to do allyship sessions for non-LGBT people during Pride. Is it better to wait until post-Pride and not take up airtime was the first part of the segment. Mm -hmm. So I think what I would say here is in light of what we were sharing earlier about not over-emphasizing or not only, I should say, prioritizing, celebrating the um, humanity and brilliance of LGBTQIA plus folks, but also investing in disrupting the systems that produce the inequity and violence that they experience. I think that running allyship sessions during Pride is not a bad idea. Um, I think that it's really important that we are talking about the role and responsibility of folks outside of LGBTQIA plus communities, those who benefit from heterosexism, cis sexism, homophobia, that we are both talking about the role and responsibility of those folks in creating conditions for equity and inclusion and belonging, and also giving them skills to do so. So doing that in pride is not a bad idea, um, but maybe thinking about that not being the only thing that you're doing, um, I think is, is something that I would say definitely to, to hold in the balance that Pride isn't only about, um, about the allyship and solidarity piece as well. Um, is this something that Phyllis Futures offers? Yes, this is something that we can certainly offer. Um, you can get in touch with Hello, um, with organizations at fearlessfutures.org um, or with myself, Ruby at Fearless Futures. Um, dot org and we can we can talk about that if that's something you're exploring um, but in terms of the actual question Marine, is there anything you want to add of like should I shouldn't I do allyship sessions during pride or post mm. yeah something that came to mind while you were talking was just being mindful of I mean it sounds like this person might be concerned with like taking up space in lieu of something else that was going to happen so maybe like is there a person part of the community that could 
volunteer to do the allyship session or, or that would be interested in doing it or like what sort of airtime would you be taking away? Um, but if, if there's not a direct conflict um, of taking away time from somebody from part of the community that had another, you know, pitch for a talk. Um, yeah, I think that absolutely allyship is an important part of part of pride. And I, I see that it would be appropriate. And it would also be appropriate before, like you talked a lot about like pre-events, Ruby, and just kind of like leveling expectations and and like communicating our our views as an organization and perhaps having like a pre-pride event in order to answer some questions. So I think that could also be a neat time for a for an allyship um event. I love that Maureen. I think that's su such a um a wonderful way to think about how, how and when different events should happen and mm -hmm. actually that as a pre-event may further create the conditions for you to have a really meaningful series of events around pride that go beyond celebration into like the meaty terrain of of building equity and inclusion mm -hmm. I love that um short question Maureen how can I connect with Maureen to find out more about her work? I'm so interested in the Institute and the academic work of EDIE. Um, so if you want to share your details or your um, LinkedIn, Maureen, I'll leave that um, to you. Great. Thank you. Um, great. Thank you to whoever asked this question. You can find me at Maureen Galvez on LinkedIn or also at the email Maureen at fearlessfutures.org. So, yeah, Thank you. Love to chat further. Um, okay, I have this is a love this question right now. What should I do to make our, our pride event even better next month? So, I'm gonna say, in addition to everything that Maureen and I have shared today, we also have a resource, um, we at Phyllis Futures on embedding the spirit of pride in our everyday. And there's a, a series of do's and don'ts within there that are really useful, practical um, things to consider in your event planning and beyond your event planning. Um, but really critical pieces around how we enhance the capacity of events to actually include folks um, both within the umbrella that we're, we're talking about here and, and those at the intersection of, of other identities. So check out that resource. Um, it's a really, really useful one um, that one of our colleagues built that I, I always go back to. Um, we have time for one more. Um, I always feel really bad because I want to get through all of them and, and we just can't. Um, but folks, if we don't get to your question, please do just drop us an email, um, either Ruby or Maureen at, at Fearless Futures. Um, so. The embracing? Yeah, I think that's, I think that'll be a really useful question, Maureen. Do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, so this question says, do you think embracing is the same as acceptance slash tolerance that you spoke about? Um, there's the language we, no, okay, basically, we use the language, um, embrace the rainbow, it's a big one in DEI initiatives at our company, but on reflecting, I'm wondering if this is, I'm wondering if this is wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, embracing the rainbow. I mean, Ruby, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Um, what, what's coming to mind for me is like, yeah, like how embracing it might not it's not an inherently problematic word um but like what are what is your company meaning by that and I'm thinking about like there's many different ways to maybe it's like embrace like we accept you you can kind of hang out over there but like still be welcome in the space or I think when we think about embrace there is a genuine like if I'm embracing you Ruby like I'm willing to learn from you. I'm willing to be changed by you. I really value what you bring to me in this relationship that is reciprocal, mm -hmm. right? Um, so it, there's not an object and a subject. There's there's a real relationship there. So I think in that sense, the word embrace can be beautiful, but can also maybe be used in a tokenistic way if we're just thinking about, oh, okay, embrace the rainbow. So mm. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Maureen. I think 
it depends on the substance of what your organization means by embracing the rainbow. Um, I think it can be code word for a politics of tolerance where it's conditional, as you spoke to really, really um, eloquently earlier, Maureen, like, are we saying we will embrace the fact that you have to exist in our organization and really mean we'll accept it? Or are we saying we actually embrace the full humanity of our LGBTQA plus colleagues and then it becomes a uh, a word that's actually interchangeable with inclusion, right? Because it means that we are not only um, embracing your humanity, but that that really becomes, that inclusion becomes part of the fabric of how we do things every day. So I would say, be clear, be explicit, like clarity is a friend um, in this work. So be explicit about what your organization means if you're using this language, knowing that, the long history of tolerance and acceptance as uh, a paradigm for inclusion, though it's it's not inclusion for LGBTQIA plus folks, we might be reading that and thinking, mm, what does this company really mean? Like, am I actually included? Am I seen? Um, am I heard? Uh, can I belong here? So be explicit. Being explicit is a friend. Um, folks, that takes us to the end of our webinar. Maureen, thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed thank you so this. much thank you all so much for your questions um and please do reach out if there's anything we didn't get to that you'd like to connect with us on further um but for now have a wonderful rest of your day wherever you are and thank you so much thank you everyone thanks ruby thanks, thanks. <laughs> thanks.